Um, my name is Nevena Dimova and I'm part of the BU Office of Technology Development. Welcome to today's uh, virtual event uh, titled Confronting Gender Bias in Investor Q&A Research and Practice for Female Innovators. We're delighted to uh, have a special guest speaker, Dr. Dana Kanz. Um, with this event, we want to recognize March 8th, uh, the International Women's Day and Women's History Month. And what more meaningful way to recognize the, this day by than by shedding light on the gender gap in innovation and raising awareness about the biases that uh, female innovators face uh, even to this day. Uh, so with the, so hopefully this is the first step in uh, addressing the underlying um, issues and striving towards a world that's more accepting, uh, welcoming uh, and fair uh, towards the diverse ideas and voices out there. And one of the benefits of uh, doing so is creating uh, an innovation ecosystem that can be uh, truly healthy and vibrant uh, and very and truly inclusive. Um, so I would like to give special thanks uh, to our co-hosts, uh, the BU Arrows Group and BU's Women's uh, Guild. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with them on this event. Um, I also want to uh, give special thanks to uh, the diversity committee uh, within the technology development office and um, the group is working very hard to identify and provide resources um, that to our investigators uh, that could help empower and connect them as they uh, conduct their research and promote um, innovative uh, and exciting work. Now I would like to introduce uh, our speaker, Dana, Dr. Dana Kanz. Uh, she's an assistant professor of organizational behavior at the London Business School. Uh, Dr. Dana Kanz holds a Bachelor's of Science in Economics from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and a Doctor of Philosophy from Columbia Business School. Her research applies behavioral insights to understand sources of labor market inequality spanning the areas of judgment and decision-making, ethics, motivation science, and entrepreneurship. Dr. Kansas' work has been published in peer-reviewed journals such as the Academy of Management Journal, Organizational Behavior and Human Decision Processes, and Science Advances, uh, as well as the practitioner outlets such as the Harvard Business Review. Her research has been featured by BBC Radio, Bloomberg, Business Insider, Chicago Boot uh, Review, Entrepreneur, Fast Company, Financial Times, Forbes, Fortune, uh, MIT Sloan Management Review, PitchBook, TechCrunch, uh, The Wall Street Journal, and Wharton Magazine. Accomplished as an ad hoc reviewer and keynote speaker, Dr. Khan started her uh, career as an investment banker and strategic consultant for Citigroup and Winterberry Group going on to co-found and run a venture-funded startup before re-entering education. So um, with, with that, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Kans for uh, your time and to welcome you. Um, and um, I'll um, let you take it from here. Um, the audience is welcome to submit questions uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, and uh, we'll seek to address as many questions as possible. Uh, if for some reason we're unable to get to your question, we'll follow up uh, with you after the event. Thank you. So thank you so much for having me here to talk about how we can all confront gender bias that lurks in entrepreneurs' interactions with investors and specifically in the questions and answers that they engage in during the question and answer process following their pitches based upon research that my colleagues listed on the bottom left of the slide here and I published over the past couple of years in the Academy of Management Journal and the Harvard Business Review. And then we're going to segue into a warm-up practice session, if you will, um, before we go ahead and engage in our own Q&A. Um, so next slide, please. So 
So um, why should we even be talking about these gendered interactions between entrepreneurs and investors? Where, well, women are at the helm of nearly 40% of companies in the US and over 30% here in the UK, where I'm a faculty member, um, the following. You could just hit forward on it. But they're only getting under 3% of the venture financing in the US and 1% here in the UK. So what these rather paradoxical set of statistics says to me is that although women are certainly encouraged to think big and there are initiatives underway to promote both women in tech and women in entrepreneurship, perhaps capital constraints are preventing women from nurturing their businesses into larger well-known entities as opposed to smaller lifestyle ones. Next slide, please. And the academic literature underscores just how critical these resources are for the success and the growth prospects of these early stage ventures. Uh, next bullet. It also provides a lot of support for the fact that there are in fact gender differences in funding outcomes. So sorry, next. <laughs> so what do we not know? Well, we don't have as good of a handle on the size and the reason behind this gap. Next slide, please. So researchers have hung their collective hats, so to speak, on the story of gender homophily or the birds of a feather flock together theory that we as individuals tend to favor those who are similar to us in one way or another. And now the intuition when applied to the context of venture pitching is that most species tend to be men and they're gonna favor male over female candidates for funding. So the culprit also becomes a potential solution whereby public policymakers and practitioners as well as researchers have hoped that as more women enter decision-making roles in venture pitching or venture funding rather, they're gonna help pave the way for more women to get funded just like their male VC counterparts have done historically. While I agree wholeheartedly that this story holds a lot of promise of playing out over the longer term, I think the next two uh, bullets here that you could slide through, yeah, tell us that it's worthwhile for us to explore other levers that we can pull while we're waiting to see the gender homophily story play out because that does require critical mass. Next slide, please. So as to what levers are at our disposal, I wanna draw our attention to two rich streams in the academic literature. The one on the left-hand side recognizes the fact that women may have different appetites for such things as degree of control, risk, industry served, and lifestyle that can cause them to seek out or demand less capital than their male counterparts. While the right-hand side literature says, no, investors are the ones doling out funding, and they make these investment decisions based upon a variety of observable characteristics, among which gender happens to be the most readily observable of them all. Neuroscientific research tells us it takes mere milliseconds for us to identify someone on the basis of gender, and then make a number of assumptions that will guide our interactions with that person going forward. So what my colleagues and I, my research, if you wanna just hit uh, next on that, has done is disentangle these two streams, holding the demand for capital constant to then peer into the supply of capital to see what, if any, biases may be lurking there. And we do this by linguistically analyzing the interactions that male versus female entrepreneurs have with investors across the course of their fundraising lifetimes um, that are associated with their ventures. Uh, next slide, please. And so in order to linguistically analyze, yeah, you could forward to the, yeah. In order to linguistically analyze these interactions, we use a social psychological theory um, called regulatory focus that was introduced into the academic literature by one of my co-authors, Columbia Business School Professor Tori Higgins, which you can see on the bottom left cited there. And this groundbreaking theory distinguishes between promotion and prevention focus. So when we're induced into promotion focus, goals are viewed as ideals. There's a strategic concern for approaching any gains and avoiding any non-gains in our immediate environment, emphasizing hopes, accomplishments, and advancement needs. When we're instead induced into prevention focus, goals are viewed as oughts. There's a strategic concern for approaching any non-losses and avoiding whatever losses happen to be in our environment, emphasizing instead safety, responsibility, 
So prevention focus has us concerned with safety responsibility and security needs instead. So when we layer in what we know from the research at the intersection of gender and venture funding, we can see that male but not female founders have been expected to have high growth aspirations emblematic of a promotion focus, while female but not male founders have instead been expected to have low risk appetites and the need to protect their ownership indicative of a prevention focus. Now, whether or not these expectations are in any way founded is very much besides the case because we'll nevertheless see how they will guide our interactions um, that, that are observed between entrepreneurs and investors in the coming slides. Next slide, please. So what my colleagues and I have done is we used this social psychological theory and leveraged it to develop a conceptual framework, starting with bias at the hands of investors, manifested as promotion questions directed towards male entrepreneurs and prevention ones towards female entrepreneurs. Now, these questions um, create this opportunity for male entrepreneurs, specifically in this gain-maximizing context of venture pitching where it's not enough to merely demonstrate you're not gonna lose your investor's money, you have to be able to promote your investment's home run potential to maximize investor gains to achieve quote unquote success in this particular gain maximizing context. Um, you can advance it now. But my colleagues and I did not stop there. We then went on to hypothesize that entrepreneurs would respond in kind to the questions that they received, just like other human beings. And so what does this actually mean? Um, you could advance it. Well, a male entrepreneur gets asked a promotion question, granting him the luxury to reinforce his association with the favorable domain of gains by simply responding in kind to a promotion question with a promotion response. While a female entrepreneur is apt to do the exact same thing, only she's likely to be fielding a prevention question with a prevention answer all the while being as thorough and conscientious as possible, but also digging herself the proverbial grave by staying in this unfavorable domain of losses and doing so. And so as we can imagine, these questions and answers give rise to this cycle of bias that is perpetuating the, these disparities between the outcomes that are achieved in funding by male versus female entrepreneurs. Well, fortunately, later on in this presentation, I'm gonna be presenting you hopefully compelling evidence um, on a promising intervention that has the potential to help us break this cycle of implicit gender bias in these interactions. Next slide, please. So my colleagues and I tested out this conceptual framework on all of the companies that had launched at the prestigious TechCrunch Disrupt competition for the years that it ran at one consistent location of New York City at that time. You can advance the slide once. Thanks. Um, and so at that time, we had nearly 200 companies and respective founding CEOs. For those of you in the audience less familiar with this competition, and I don't think many of you are unfamiliar with it given the audience today, um, an entrepreneur, a, a founding CEO um, gets up on stage and presents his or her startup for a period of six minutes, followed by six minutes of questions and answers that he or she engages in with some of the world's most prominent venture capitalists and super angels. Now, the very first thing that we did after I gathered all of the videos and my co-author team and I had them all transcribed was we found that entrepreneurs, so male and female entrepreneurs, presented themselves and their companies with similar degrees of promotion and prevention focus in keeping with prior literature that has not found gender differences in promotion and prevention language that are, that are used by individuals. So being able to rule out this piece of the puzzle, we then moved on to those questions and answers that the entrepreneurs engaged in with those venture capitalists and super angels. So I wanna give you a taste for some of these interactions by playing you two short consecutive videos. The first of which is going to be an interaction between a male founding CEO and a, an investor. And where do you want to get if everything is fine? Hey, hey, I'm sorry, if you could repeat that, please. What is your aspiration? Our aspiration in terms of the business. What, what we aspire to do with this business is that we want to be able to replace um, what people ultimately have in the wallet with, a, with an identification card, not just your driver's license, but identification card to be mobile. 
similar to what Apple Pay has done with the credit card, where they're replacing the credit cards you would have in your wallet being online. So what we hopefully heard Yossi Vardy do here is he called to mind the ideal future state of this business. And then he used the words aspire and aspiration that are literally in the promotion focus dictionary that I'll be showing you in a couple of slides. And another thing that you may not have noticed because it was so subtle and so seamless was that this male founding CEO had the opportunity to remain in this favorable domain of gains by simply saying, we aspire to do X, Y, Z. So motivationally matching what the question was that he received. And another just anecdotal um, comment of interest may be the fact that this particular company could not possibly be more prevention focused. So it's all about the safety and security of your wallet. So it was particularly interesting to see that they kept fielding these promotion focused questions that were induced by um, the gender of the founding CEO. So the next interaction that I'm gonna play for you is one between a female founding CEO and an investor instead. Um, as you think about users, uh, uh companies coming on to use your platform, there's going to be a lot of data that comes out that, you know, this is a common problem on this device. This is, you know, something you should be careful of on, on this device. Are you able to share that cross company because of privacy issues or how do you sort of help developers get better at building on each of these devices? We, we, we are thinking about that, but this is not what we're actually primarily focusing on at the moment. What we're prim primarily focusing on at the moment is actually, you know, giving this real-life interaction. So, you know, one thing that we're really focusing on is just how to, uh, you, know, you know, even switching and switching between the devices, make it, you know, make it in the best possible way for our clients. So what we instead heard investor Dave Tish do here is... He questioned how this female founding CEO is going to be able to satisfy this existing customer base that she and her team has. In the face of a number of different concerns that he introduces into the dialogue, such as those related to privacy, and then he goes ahead and uses the word careful, which we're going to see is in the prevention focus dictionary. And one of the things that you may have noticed is that she does attempt to answer that question as thoroughly and thoughtfully and conscientiously as possible for sure but she does still remain in this unfavorable domain of losses by saying we are looking to satisfy this existing customer base and to not lose these customers essentially. Which we're going to see is a key difference when we're talking about clients in a couple of slides. So now that we've gotten a taste for some of these interactions, I want to start digging into what the data told us from the field. So first and foremost, do we even see any difference in the funds raised by male versus female led ventures, given the fact that they've all launched a TechCrunch, they all had to have been of such high quality and have all demonstrated a true demand for capital to even be included in this sample. Well, unfortunately, we did find that male led ventures went on to raise five times as much capital as their female led counterparts. And these results um, of our regressions, so I'm, I'm showing you these uh, mean differences, but the results of our regressions remain significant even as we started to layer in some of these other factors that are referenced on the bottom of the slide here that may affect funding outcomes for startups. So as to why this may be occurring, my co-authors and I performed two very different sets of analyses. The first of which is to upload this dictionary of promotion and prevention terms into a linguistic inquiry and word count software called Luke that generates the frequencies terms in a body of text. In this case, that text happens to be um, the transcriptions of all of those videos that I just gave you a quick taste of. And as you can see here, I took the liberty of bolding two of the terms used by um, Yossi Vardy on the left-hand side and one of the terms used by Dave Tish on the right-hand side. So you can see how they're falling into these two very different dictionaries. Now the next, um, distinct set of methodologies is to have each and every one of the nearly 2,000 questions and corresponding answers in these exchanges that I just gave you a taste of manually coded by a team of coders at the Tori Higgins uh, Motivation Science Lab at Columbia uh, University. So we were in very good hands since that team dealt with uh, promotion and prevention and still does on a regular basis. So as we can see here, regardless of the topic at hand, 
An intention can be framed in promotion or prevention. So let's take the topic of customers up top here. A promotion oriented question sounds like, how do you plan to acquire or gain new customers? While a prevention one is all about how you plan to retain, AKA not lose the customers that you already have. And this should uh, be reminiscent of the interaction that we just saw that female founding CEO have with one of the investors. So these two very different sets of methodologies converged upon the common wisdom that investor questions do in fact vary according to the gender of the entrepreneur that they happen to be addressing. And for illustrative purposes, I wanna show you that a whopping 67% of the questions posed to male entrepreneurs were prevent promotion focused, while 66% of those posed to female entrepreneurs were prevention focused. So the differences were quite stark here. And one of the interesting tidbits um, on this was that both male and female investors behave similarly to um, ask male entrepreneurs promotion questions and then turn around and ask female entrepreneurs prevention questions. So this is something that we all are apt to do. We're, we're all vulnerable to this implicit bias and it's not just that these male investors are the bad guys. So now that we've seen that investor questions do in fact vary according to the gender of the entrepreneur they're addressing, what, if any, um, impact does this have on the funds that these startups go on to raise? Well, it has a significant impact whereby those startups that were asked predominantly promotion-focused questions went on to raise seven times as much funding as those that were asked predominantly prevention ones. And with each and every additional prevention-focused question asked, our analyses show that entrepreneurs went on to raise nearly $4 million in less funding. So it has this significant impact on the growth trajectory of these early stage ventures. It's such a critical time in their life cycle. I want to draw your attention back to this conceptual framework to remind you that it's not just about the questions posed to entrepreneurs, but it's also about how entrepreneurs are apt to respond to the questions that they receive. And recall that we had hypothesized this behavior of motivational matching, which will not advantage you if you happen to be getting prevention focused questions, right? Well, we found that there is a significant matching behavior whereby 85% of our sample of entrepreneurs matched their responses to the orientation, promotion or prevention of the questions that they received. And recall that I had promised you there was a silver lining to our findings. Those plucky entrepreneurs who managed to switch focus, responding to prevention questions with promotion focus answers, went on to raise 14 times more funding than all of those folks who were apt to simply respond to prevention questions with prevention answers, like we are all as human beings likely to do. So we were so in infused by this, uh, this result and excited and inspired by it that we conducted a series of controlled experiments to see if there was any causal relationship at play here. So we conducted these experiments on nearly 200 accredited investors and over 100 would be non-accredited ones where we exposed them to questions and answers that were manipulated specifically for promotion versus prevention focus that were redacted from actual TechCrunch Disrupt transcripts, which was really cool. And we got the opportunity to hold all other characteristics about the startups and their respective entrepreneurs uh, constant. And we created four six minute audio files of 10 questions and answers that really simulated the exact environment that investors had with entrepreneurs at TechCrunch Disrupt competitions. So if you were a participant in this particular experiment, you received this prompt that you work for a venture fund that's pre-vetted for ventures and determined each one meets the fund's investing criteria in terms of industry, geography, and stage of development. You now have the opportunity to hear the founder and CEO of each venture respond to 10 questions posed by a partner of your fund. After listening to each Q&A, you will be given the opportunity to allocate a sum out of a total $400,000 to each venture as you see fit. So what we found with these experimental results is that they reinforced our findings from the field. Both of these very different sets of investors allocated significantly more funding to the conditions where entrepreneurs were asked promotion as, a, as opposed to prevention questions. And what's even more um, interesting is the fact that the switching behavior is also 
um, significant in this experimental controlled setting, just as it was in the field. We found that both of these very different sets of investors allocated significantly more funding to the conditions where entrepreneurs switched rather than match focus, responding to prevention questions with promotion focused responses. So these two different studies, the field and the experimental evidence, point to prescriptions for both investors and entrepreneurs. But first and foremost, I'd love to talk about the consequences for investors. So by asking a disproportionately lower amount of prevention-focused questions of male candidates for funding, they may be overexposing themselves to downside risk. And likewise, by asking a disproportionately lower amount of promotion-focused questions of female candidates for funding, they may be underexposing themselves to upside potential in those candidates. So they're not maximizing returns for their portfolios by engaging in this behavior. So what can they do about it? Well, they can um, learn about this distinction so that they can work to um, consciously reform their data intake processes ahead of time. And those data intake processes include the questions and answers that they will be engaging in with um, with prospective candidates for funding. And so this is one thing that I have been working hard with different funds and angel investor groups to actually do. So while these investors are quote unquote getting their acts together, um, reforming these best practices for data intake so that they have consistent information from both male and female candidates for funding, you can learn about the promotion versus prevention distinction of the questions that you're asked. And if you recognize that you're getting asked a prevention focused question, answer the question at hand by all means, but merely respond by highlighting the promotion focused information as well. So that you're able to garner higher amounts of funding for yourselves and your respective startups. So I want to engage in a little bit of a warm up before we um, have our own Q and A at the end of this session by allowing you to simply enter a response in the little Q&A box that we have here um, that I'll be monitoring. And um, so I'm gonna throw out a softball question that will be um, a pretty layup question about promotion or prevention so we can just practice a little bit. So this first question is the following framed in promotion or prevention. So all you have to do is just use that question box to type in promotion or prevention. Can you talk to how big this market could potentially be based upon a larger set of customers who can ideally use the data that you've gathered? Great, yeah, you are on top of it here. Thank you for all these terrific answers. That is correct. So this last question was framed in promotion and it's because it emphasized the large size of that overall market pie and the opportunity to gain even more customers in that segment. So please let me know what you think about this following one. How do you plan to defend your startups market share given how competitive this landscape is? Yeah, you are not easily fooled here. Very, very good. Uh, just as I suspected, you're all on top of it. This last question was framed in prevention, emphasizing how to protect, aka not lose your portion or piece of that pie of the market. And so this is just one potential reframe that we can use. It's a generic one that I always, um, when talking to entrepreneurs, uh, work with them to personalize for their particular business. But essentially, you can weave in information that denotes the following, that we're playing in such a large and fast growing market that's bound to attract new entrants. We hope to gain increasing share in this attractive market by leveraging these unique assets of our startup. And then you've essentially redirected that dialogue into this favorable domain of gains in doing so. So what about this next question? How do you plan to monetize your users? This one tends to be trickier for people. So, but not for you apparently. So yes, the last question here was framed in promotion because it emphasized 
the opportunity to um, achieve these sales gains by earning revenue. And so the last question that we're going to tackle now is, how long is it going to take you to break even given your monthly burn rate? Yep, very, very, you're basically four for four here. So the last question was in the domain of prevention because it emphasized how to go from this negative to simply zero. So you, that's a status quo position rather than to a plus one and beyond position. So we could reframe our response with some rendition of if this is the case for you. Um, we're actually playing we're actually managing this business for aggressive top line growth with a good deal of sales momentum so far. Here is what our run rate looks like. Our goal is to expand our margins as we grow our top line throughout this forecast period. And then again, you've redirected that dialogue to be able to highlight this promotion focus information as well. But again, make sure that you are still staying on topic and answering the main thrust of the question that you've received. So I want to make sure that everybody has this handy leave behind one pager and I'll definitely um, liaise with, with Misty and the whole team um, to ensure anyone gets this who may find it handy. And I am open for business, ready to take questions at this point um, from Navenna and team. Dr. Khan's amazing, very informative, um, really exciting. I uh, will start off uh, the Q&A. I have a couple of questions here and Naven and I uh, will alternate. Um, so our first question is, um, the 2014 Diana Project states that companies with a woman executive on the team were more likely to receive later stage funding However, many companies with women entrepreneurs received significantly less than the total investments in the early and seed stages. Do you think this shows that women entrepreneur, entrepreneurs have to prove themselves before investors will agree to fund their businesses? And what advice would you give to women seeking early and seed stage funding? That's a terrific question. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's important to, I just want to restate those findings as I know them. So they found that I believe that companies with women on their exec teams that receive venture funding tend to be older and more established and therefore receive later stage funding while less mm -hmm. often receiving the early stage in the angel investment funding. And so this mm -hmm. finding in my opinion is entirely in line with the way that heuristics tend to work. And so um, those heuristics include representativeness that underlies many gender stereotypes. And so these shortcuts we know tend to be deployed under conditions of high uncertainty and low track record of historical information. So in the absence of that information, investors and other human beings are likely mm -hmm. to rely on heuristics in their day-to-day yeah. -day decision making. And those heuristics are unfortunately vulnerable to bias, including gender bias. So this is why my work and that of others explores and demonstrates those disparities in that early stage funding. To me, these findings point directly to prescriptions for first and foremost investors, um, rather than for the, the women seeking out early stage and seed stage funding. But I do have, as, as you've seen, prescriptions for each. But my prescriptions that I gave here and those that are born out of some of my recent work um, really point to the critical need for investors to reform those data intake processes that I touched upon briefly during my presentation. So that goes from the initial introductory application processes through that pitch deck submission onto the questions and answers in their discussions with those candidates, and then even through that due diligence that they perform. So the idea is that we want to prevent investors from having to fill in the blanks with those assumptions. We want all candidates to instead have that equal opportunity to fill in all the blanks with the available information that they have at that stage. Thank you, very uh, great answer. Oh, awesome. I think also pointing to the um, one pager that you provided, I think you know us maybe sharing that with the groups and potential investors 
who uh, you know we're in contact with and just making it a normal uh, piece of uh, you know the, the fundraising effort. Thank you. Um, I have You're another welcome. part of uh, the question, but it's 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 going more to this um, you know how we should behave. Well, when women are given fewer opportunities to present themselves in a beneficial manner compared to male colleagues, should they frame themselves as a disruptor or more male, male-like in their early stages of their startup? Essentially, should they be inauthentic to win, um, you know, essentially win that funding, or is there a place for authenticity in um, receiving the investments? Yeah, that's another really terrific question, and it's one that I grapple with all the time. So I'll first tackle the part about authenticity, and this is my opinion, but I think in any kind of ongoing interaction, whether it be promoting yourself in a job interview for a role in which you'll be engaging on an ongoing basis with that employer or promoting yourself and your business in a pitch setting where you will hope to engage with that standalone investor or fund on an ongoing basis, I think it behooves us to be authentic where our espous espoused values inherently match the actions and vice versa that we undertake. So otherwise that misalignment will become evident in one way or another sooner or later and any dissonance is going to find its way back to haunt you. Yeah. These are my personal opinions, but I've, I've seen that play out. So when it comes to the inherent values and objectives that most investors happen to have, I don't think that they're necessarily misaligned with those of female candidates for funding. And I think female candidates just need those same opportunities to showcase that information to investors so that they can actually see it and use it in their decision-making. And um, when it comes to disruption, I wanna point out that framing themselves as disruptors isn't actually necessarily something inauthentic for women to do. So one of my research streams actually delves into the identities of disruptors versus builders. Mm -hmm. And I myself had expected that women would identify significantly less than men would with being disruptors. So just like we, you had been talking about. Mm -hmm. And then I gathered this large sample of data on male versus female um, identification as being builders versus disruptors versus both builders and disruptors versus neither. And although I found that the data did show that women are a few percentage points lower than men when it comes to identifying as disruptors, and some of my work shows that framing in that language of disruption does prove to be beneficial for early stage funding outcomes. Okay. The gender differences actually have never been statistically significant for me. And I've looked for them, believe me, wow. again and again. So when it comes to women versus men identifying as disruptors, so we do have, and myself included, gendered expectations of them doing so. Um, but yeah, I was never able to find this statistically significant. So that framing isn't necessarily inauthentic for women. Um, based upon at least my my research that I've been conducting. And believe me, I've been trying to look for any gender differences <laughs> and have not been able to find them. No, but thank you. You've, you know, just again, offered us uh, further insights. I completely agree with you too. Again, that's my opinion, but I uh, do completely agree with you. Um, I'll now uh, hand it over to Navenna just to do the next question. Thank you, Misty. Um, Dr. Gans, um, so there was, there is research from, uh, uh, the group of uh, Dr. Lakshmi Bhavachandra at Babson College that has explored how CEOs do gender and engage in gender gymnastics by varying their femininities and masculinities in the in the workplace. Do you do you believe that there is a benefit of employing uh, gender gymnastics um, to gain that kind of acceptance and and uh, success? That is also a really thoughtful question. So um, first off, I'm a huge fan of Professor Balachandra's ongoing work in this area. She's done a lot in that area. And she and her colleagues, I believe, recently found very recently that in their pitches, female entrepreneurs actually tend to avoid the kinds of um, overtly male and female gendered language that can have adverse effects in terms of investor evaluations, with the exception of the inspirational language that they found can increase investor interest and which dovetails with 
a lot of what we know from the top management team literature and the leadership literature that shows the benefits of transformational leadership in clearly articulating this compelling vision for the future of your business that can fill people with this hope and this encouragement, right? To get behind that vision and somehow be a part of it, whether that's as team members or as investors or as partners or as customers. And so I say um, that makes a lot of sense what they recently found when it comes to that inspirational language. Thank you. And, and do you have any advice on, on how to do um, gender in, in certain situations, especially, I guess, when communicating to VCs and funders uh, about uh, one's business and um, business plan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I have this ongoing work that is un unfortunately um, not ready to share yet. So I can't share those results, but it involves this archival study of a decade's worth of STEM talks actually that might be um, quite relevant for the audience that happens to be listening in today. And so my colleague here and I looked at um, the STEM talks that have been given by male versus female scientists that use language high versus low in references to power and dominance. And then we look at how the talks are received in terms of sentiment analysis. And um, uh, we've coupled this with an experiment that we're currently undergoing right now to understand why the effects occur and whether audience members happen to believe in the veracity of that scientific information that's conveyed, and then how they intend to then act upon the knowledge that is imparted to them. And so since this study is relevant to female innovators, I look forward to being in a position soon to share those results, which I'm really excited about because we are exploring um, that type of, it's tangential to your question, but it's essentially in this wheelhouse and it's really my first foray in, into this area. Um, but yeah, TBD on that because I just don't have um, that those tangible results right now. Thank you, and we look forward to to the publication and uh, learning more about your studies. Absolutely. So my next question is also a two part question. Um, so beyond language usage, what other examples of gender bias have you uh, encountered? and um, how do you overcome them? And then are there greater barriers to women-led startups in the STEM field versus consumer beauty and media industries? Yeah, so thanks for bringing this up because I am really excited to share my results um, that were published just recently in Science Advances. Um, so they're open access to anyone to read the full findings. Um, and those were conducted with collaborators at Stockholm School of Economics and at University of Queensland and Columbia Business School and George Washington University. And so we together found that industry served also does play a role in, mm -hmm. um, in this gender bias. So across okay. this observational study that we conducted on nearly 400 um, male versus female led comparable tech ventures, and then we couple that with an experiment involving between 100 and 200 investors, we found that female but not male founding CEOs are in fact handicapped when they're raising capital for ventures in those industries that represent a gender incongruity based on the percentage of male versus female employed in those industries. So we're talking um, struggling to raise capital for a fintech play as opposed to a fashion tech one, just to give you one tangible example. And so um, specifically, female adventures raise less funding at lower valuations for lower retained equity when raising ventures in these male dominated as opposed to female dominated industries. While the male adventures raise comparable amounts regardless of industry served, there were no significantly different results for them across these different types of industries. And we dug into those results and we found out using the experimental study that this is because investors perceive those female founding CEOs to represent significantly less of a fit with their ventures mm -hmm. when catering to the male as opposed to the female dominated industries. And we did not find any difference in their perceptions of the male founding CEOs with their ventures uh, you know, across these different industries mm -hmm. served. So that would be why. Thank you, Dana. Um, 
Yeah, that, and that's what we're seeing, uh, you know, I think generally, and, and everyone has heard the data um, just recently, you know, I know there has been efforts, especially in, in pitching where, you know, the teams there, uh, the VC firms are specifically looking for teams, right, that are diverse. And, uh, you know, some, some teams do have challenges in doing that. Um, but I think that's even a, a more of a reason uh, as to why women should become involved uh, now. And that mm -hmm. now's the time to do that. Um, so I'll hand the, this over to Nivena to uh, ask the next question. Yeah. Um, how can uh, institutions and organizations, uh, you think uh, Ghana can do a better job of engaging and preparing their female inventors for entrepreneurship? Uh, we um, constantly um, engage with our scientists and oftentimes uh, get asked those kind of questions. And, and also, are there any models or programs that you're aware of um, uh, that have worked well in, in sort of preparing this um, next generation of entrepreneurs? Thank you for that question. Yeah, I'm a big believer that women do not have to do anything different to quote unquote fix themselves. And that belief is definitely borne out in the data from my research as well. So I tend to not have too many prescriptions for them, but I do see the benefit for sure of entrepreneur boot camps where entrepreneurs actively raising money can practice building relevant questions and then iterating on their responses as they go so that they become part of their quote unquote muscle memory essentially or second nature and they become more and more comfortable telling their story over time. And so once they have that comfort level, I've seen them then in the place to have this real exchange where they're evaluating the investors as a partner fit um, as well, rather than having their quote unquote backs up against the wall and um, being put in a defensive stance, right? And so in terms of preparation, um, my recent work actually points to investors benefiting from more preparation themselves. So one silver lining in the study that I was just talking to Misty about um, that emerged in our results was that the lack of fit driven gender gaps um, tightened for female led ventures in female versus male led industries when um, those opportunities were evaluated by accredited as opposed to non accredited investors. And so this slight attenuation of this lack of fit bias among the more sophisticated investors indicates it may be beneficial to earmark more resources that foster financial literacy among those investors um, who are involved in that really early stage uh, part of the venture funding cycle. So um, a lot of my prescriptions, again, are for those investors. Um, but again, I do have really positive experiences seeing entrepreneurs um, answers really come to life when they personalize them, having these role play interactions ahead of time. Are you seeing a positive change in sort of the, the culture, in the VC culture and sort of uh, adoption of those, uh, those prescriptions? And, and is there, um, I guess, a hope for, for, for tangible change? I would like to leave off on a very hopeful note. Um, I do think that we are just at the tip of the iceberg of the process where we're in that awareness stage. And I think a lot of investors who I talk to, I talk to investors around the world, they're in these different stages and phases of the process, but a lot of them are still in the, the awareness part of that. And so they're not quite ready for the behavior modification, but I am working with funds who are proactively approaching me as well as other researchers to say, hey, what is what are the research driven best practices that we should be thinking about implementing in our data intake? And I'm so, um, so energized by those discussions that have been coming my way um, with more and more frequency over, I'd say, the past 12 to 18 months. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that that will really happen when they start implementing those best practices, as opposed to just saying, hey, we're, we're now aware of, uh, of the problem. I'd like to see them moving forward into that behavior modification phase. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's really exciting. And uh, thank you for also engaging with those VC 
forums and, and sort of sharing with them insights that hopefully will lead to long lasting and more um, perceptible change. Uh, so thank you again for your time, uh, Dr. Kanz. We really are um, grateful um, to have you share with us your important and exciting research and hope to welcome you in person sometime soon. I know, uh, I, I, I'm so, so upset that this time last year, we had yeah. everything set up for me to come and I'm so excited to be on campus. And so hopefully sometime soon, maybe when I'm ready to share those new results that I just alluded to earlier. Absolutely. Update. That would be wonderful. And we cannot wait uh, to have you visit with us. Uh, thanks to everyone uh, who uh, attended this event. Um, and we'll um, share with you some resources that uh, Dr. Kanz kindly is offering to make available um, and hope to uh, see you again at future events. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.